Twagwalapu to all you people. Twagwalapu, Gwalapu da Ishid. You're my friends, my relatives. Wakos Kadab Titsta. My name is Wakos Kadab. Stohobschud. I am Snohomish. O Ululus Chazata Spakwa Guith. Travel in the Blue Heron Canoe. And so I've been on the Salish Seas on the coast of Washington and Vancouver Island, up the Inside Passage, throughout Puget Sound. We went so far past the Inside Passage, uh, it was closer to Alaska than it was to Washington. And I've been doing it for a couple of years, and so I know a little bit about the Salish Seas. Just a little. And so I'm, um, I'm also the father of the Blue Heron Canoe. Uh, and I've got a, a feather, a, a several other hats, uh, president of uh, Stahobj Cultural and Family Services. I've been working with the Greater Kent Historical Society uh, and their museum down in Kent. And a few, few other hats. Uh, the snow had stopped uh, the native gift making that we were doing with Edmond College. Um, and I've been getting ready, uh, planning on the trip. So for instance, how am I gonna get a moving van where the nearest town is 11 miles away? So I gotta make arrangements for all that. And so uh, I've been working on that. Uh, replacement of, of uh, things like uh, moving vans. So I've been pretty busy. And I got invited to this. I don't, I don't understand uh, much about it, but I do recognize a face or two and that, that feels pretty good. So I wanted to in, introduce uh, a Snohomish tribal member. I understand he's got uh, two, two doctorates, only the one. Um, <laughs> you, you, you know, they, they said that I have now three PhDs Post hole diggers. <laughs> you don't have to laugh. They're not that funny. Um, and and so um, and and you're with some fellowships and you've got a lot of awards and check out his bio. It's pretty impressive. But I want to do introduce him. He's been to our meetings. He's been. I have, I've taught class to his mom and his sister and, and a few other things like that. Uh, and um, so he's like a brother, but I'm introducing him, um, somebody that's up here, and he is up there. So thank you. Uh, Josh Reed. Okay, so how am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> All right, let me just change things up here. So I would like to take a moment to thank several people for making tonight's talk happen, including Nick Grawl and Glennis Young from the History Department, along with, of course, Mike Evans, my tribal chairman of the Snohomish Tribe of Indians. I would also like to thank the American Indian Studies Chair, Chris Tuton, who will be moderating the question and answer session at the end of my presentation. Now I'm opening here with a two-part acknowledgement, a variation of what many of you might think you recognize as a land acknowledgement. So today we meet on the historical and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot Nations and other Coast Salish peoples who call the water and coastline of the Salish Sea home. What I'm doing with this evening's acknowledgement, though, is more than just the usual token performance. I've begun choosing to only provide a land acknowledgement at public events like this if I can also highlight an opportunity for audience members to give to a local indigenous organization. And tonight, that organization is the University of Washington's Marvin Oliver Memorial Endowed Fund 
for undergraduate students in American Indian Studies. The QR code on the screen gives you all an opportunity to do this. I also prefer to get only give an acknowledgement when I have a moment to unpack some important words within it, which I would like to do now. Peoples. I use the plural form of this word when discussing indigenous peoples because it highlights the diversity of native North America. Many non-natives mistakenly assume that American Indians or First Nations peoples are all one monolithic cultural group, the Indians, right? Historical and contemporary. Too often, non-natives are comfortable studying or thinking about indigenous peoples in the safety of the past. They mistakenly assume that native peoples, especially authentic ones, do not exist today. Lands and waters. For many indigenous peoples, especially those in the Pacific Northwest, both land and water were important components of their homes. They derived a rich living from the land, sea, rivers, and lakes, and many still depend on these spaces for their livelihoods today. And nations. This word speaks to the particular association that indigenous peoples have with the United States. These are tribal nations that have specific political relationships with the larger nation state. So, that was part one of the acknowledgement. The other part is what I like to think of as my accountability acknowledgement. As a UW professor working on indigenous homelands, I am accountable to supporting native students and the tribal nations with whom I work. I do this in various ways on campus, through the classes I teach, and the undergraduate and graduate students I mentor and by donating annually to the Marvin Oliver Fund. Beyond campus, I do this by working collaboratively with native nations, by developing curricula for K through 12 schools, and by serving as an expert witness at times, among other commitments. And I would like to challenge each person here or every organization that does a land acknowledgement to consider ways that they are accountable to indigenous peoples. Just acknowledging a native presence is no longer enough. So opening with this two-part acknowledgement is about more than just passively noting an indigenous presence. It highlights a few themes that I will touch upon this evening, and more importantly, it is a reminder that despite the United States' best efforts to erase native peoples, we are still here. So let's start with that erasure piece, specifically ways that my ancestors avoided erasure. Recently, I was looking through a family archive that my grandfather, Marvin Daly, had compiled decades ago when I came across this document. Writing to the superintendent of the Chemoa Indian School in Salem, Oregon, Carolyn Daly explained in September of 1913 that I have four children and would like to enter them in your school. The oldest is 16 years old and the youngest is seven. I am a hardworking woman and have no way of supporting them only by myself. I am a widow. When she wrote this letter, she was 46 years old and had three additional children who were too old for school. And technically, she was not a widow, but her husband lived in Port Angeles, probably for work, and Caroline was on her own for years, a de facto widow. She lived in a small four-room house on San Juan Island with all but one of her oldest children. And this letter, copy was bundled with a slew of other documents in my grandfather's archives, giving us a glimpse into the lives of my relatives from more than a century ago. Some detail Caroline's status as an Indian, the health of her children, and her dire poverty 
For example, this voucher from a local insurance agent attests that Ted Daly, one of Caroline's children, is known and recognized in the community there at Friday Harbor as an Indian who needs to be taught at a boarding school because the mother is financially unable to clothe and support him. Ted was one of my maternal grandfather's uncles. Others revealed that Myra, one of the four, one of the four children sent to Chemoa, returned home in 1919 after having died suddenly of appendicitis at the age of 10. Her older sister, Gertrude, accompanied the body home. This must have been a weighty responsibility for this 17-year-old young woman. They also reveal that Caroline identified as a Mitchell Bay Indian, a community there on San Juan Island of Sklalem and Saanich ancestry, and sometimes described herself and her children as Lummi. Her oldest son, Arthur Daly, married Martha Rethlifson, a Snohomish Indian who could also trace her ancestry back to a Cowlitz chief on her maternal grandmother's side. So the archive that my grandfather left highlights the consequences of 19th century federal Indian policies, such as treaty making and allotment, that drove many Coast Salish families, like the Dalys, into precarity by the early 20th century, a period that most historians recognize as the nadir of indigenous sovereignty in North America. Caroline was literally so poor that she couldn't feed and clothe her four youngest children. Her only solution was to enroll several in an Indian boarding school which in the more than three decades that it had been open, had already become an institution feared by many Native families in the Pacific Northwest. Tools of settler colonialism, boarding schools like Chemoa sought to erase indigenous languages, values, and practices, instead preparing Native children to assume poorly paying menial jobs and to firmly separate them from their homelands, practices, and livelihoods. More importantly, and this is what I'm arguing with my talk this evening, we see that these families leveraged Coast Salish kinship networks and the federal Indian bureaucracy to stay in their homelands and survive settler colonialism. These examples also highlight the role of indigenous women in navigating these cross-cultural encounters and changes. Indeed, their actions were instrumental for survival amid these challenging circumstances. Coast Salish families, like mine, experienced varying degrees of success and failure in the generations after the United States extended its control over the Pacific Northwest. So I'd like to take us back to the early 19th century, when Coast Salish families thrived from a highly mobile lifestyle across our homelands in this part of what some now call the Salish Sea. These weren't aimless wanderings. These were purposeful and regular moves to specific locations where families held rights to harvest, hunt, and fish. Generations of indigenous knowledge about being at the right place at the best time to pick berries when they were ripe, to hunt mammals when they were at their fattest, and to take salmon when they were spawning, allowed Coast Salish peoples to experience good lives without overtaxing their resources, which we understood and continue to see as other than human kin. We are all familiar with the ways that Coast Salish families relied on a wealth of seafood, especially salmon, for both subsistence and commercial purposes. Families spent the summer months living in small fishing camps spread across a wide geographic area where they could catch fish and preserve it. One important food that we often overlook is camas a bulb plant cultivated by native women in fields that they owned and marked off with low rock walls. 
It was harvested in the autumn and women pit roasted or boiled the bulb. It could also be dried and pounded into a flour. It tastes a little bit like a sweet potato, but sweeter. And prairies on Whidbey Island and the San Juans were among the best camas fields across Coast Salish homelands. And these weren't just natural prairies that happened to have a few camas bulbs. These were cultivated fields, created and maintained this way by the precise use of fire. And before treaty times, Coast Salish peoples lived as large extended families spread across the entire Salish Sea. And this map locates winter village sites of one or more large longhouses. It's a little hard to see on the map. Actually, it's a lot easier to see on the big old screen. But you see the brown uh, kind of longhouse tokens there on the map. That's, the, that's, that's marking all those various village sites. So individuals commonly married someone from outside the village and sometimes from distant communities. These kinds of connections were valued among Coast Salish peoples who measured a person's wealth according to one's social ties. Communities came together for various purposes, to fish, to defend each other, to resolve conflicts. They shared languages, cultural practices, and kin. Some villages, such as the one at today's Garrison Bay, where my ancestor Carolyn's mother had likely lived, were regionally cosmopolitan, and Coast Salish families had lived there for about 2,000 years at that particular village. By the early 19th century, that Coast Salish village on northeastern San Juan Island was home to Laktemish, Sklalem, Lakwangan, Swinomish, Semiamu, Samish, Tsuk, and Saanich peoples from what is today British Columbia and Washington. From this village, native peoples fished at family-owned reef net sites and cultivated camas in nearby prairies. But in 1860, as part of the military escalation over the infamous Pig War that settled the Pacific Northwest border dispute between Great Britain and the United States, British troops dismantled the village to build their own garrison and parade grounds, thereby dispossessing Caroline's maternal family. 19th century Coast Salish peoples maintained fluid and complex socio-political boundaries. As evident in my own ancestry, many families had relatives from other communities, and any single individual belonged to numerous communities, or even tribal nations as we come to know them today. So think of it this way. The Coast Salish homelands resemble the night sky. Each family was a star, a group of stars combined to constellations, mapping family and affiliations across various parts of our homelands. But in the case of Coast Salish families and communities, these constellations changed over time or shifted as one's perspective did or reconfigured to make new groupings. Specific Coast Salish societies, these constellations, thought of themselves as being from a specific location with well understood relations to myriad other places. So let's consider one such constellation. My people, the Snohomish. By the mid 19th century, Snohomish families could be found as far west as the Chimicum Valley on the Olympic Peninsula, on the southern part of Whidbey Island, and south of the Stillaguamish River, to the Snohomish River, where they lived on both sides and up all its tributaries. In the late fall, our families came together at key village sites, including Hibolb and Silax a large village at Priest Point, both just south of Tulalip, and several on Whidbey Island, one at Sandy Point opposite of Tulalip, and another at the southern point on the island. In the 1790s, Snohomish people began encountering non-natives, specifically the George Vancouver Expedition, which mapped much of our coastal homelands and renamed the body of water, what we called Woolj, Puget Sound. 
Many of these early encounters benefited Coast Salish peoples like the Snohomish, who gained access to valued trade goods. Arrival of fur traders, especially the Hudson's Bay Company, increased these interactions in Coast Salish homelands. In 1827, the Hudson's Bay Company established Fort Langley, the mouth of the Fraser River in the northern part of the Salish Sea. You can see it there on the map. It was followed by Fort Nisqually in 1833 and Fort Victoria in 1843. In 1840, the Hudson's Bay Company incorporated the Puget Sound Agricultural Company, designed to supply the local fur traders with food and livestock. And along with other regional native communities, Snohomish individuals provided these forts and traders with fish, some of which was preserved in barrels and shipped far outside the region. And canoe loads, canoe loads of berries, some labored in the forts while others occasionally ran afoul of the Hudson's Bay Company when they poached the occasional livestock that had dug up clam beds or camas fields. And essentially, Coast Salish peoples then saw these fur traders as a new community, just like any other people with whom they already had relations. So they naturally valued establishing kinship connections with Hudson's Bay Company employees, thereby incorporating them into their constellations of kin. Commerce and kinship with the newcomers bolstered one's prestige. There were also more practical reasons for these intercommunity marriages. Interracial families acted as a bridge to ease tensions and enhance a family's resources. These early interactions, though, were more complicated than just native peoples meeting white British traders. The Hudson's Bay Company employed many Kanaka Maoli, native Hawaiians, and indigenous peoples from the Great Lakes region. Some of these peoples remained in the Pacific Northwest and married into our communities. And in these early decades of the 19th century, New England traders also visited the region, coasting along our shores to purchase furs and fish from Coast Salish peoples. And with the California Gold Rush in 1849, some Americans began squatting on Coast Salish lands to set up sawmills that churned out lumber and prefabricated buildings for booming California towns and mining operations. Mill owners employed local natives to build the sawmills, cut down the trees, and to mill the actual timber, along with provisioning these operations. So the first several generations of encounters, though, exposed Coast Salish peoples to Eurasian crowd diseases, including measles, 1824 and 1848, waves of smallpox epidemics, in 1775, 1801, and 1853. These epidemics likely brought Coast Salish pop the Coast Salish population in Puget Sound from an extraordinarily conservative estimate of 12,000 to just under 5,000 by the mid-19th century. Survivors moved in with extended kin across our homelands and reconfigured into new constellations of political affiliations. And the first example, this is probably the first example of my ancestors leveraging these kinship networks to weather the beginnings of colonial intrusions in our homelands. Perhaps this is what brought that distant Cowlitz ancestor north to Snohomish villages. In the midst of this demographic crisis, Coast Salish peoples encountered the next challenge the expansion of US settler colonialism. White American settlers were profoundly different from fur traders who depended on good relations with native peoples for furs to flow. Settlers sought native lands and direct control over resources. And while early white settlements in the Salish Sea depended on the goodwill and labor of Coast Salish peoples, as increasing numbers of settlers came, 
the outsiders then found indigenous communities, especially native nations, as impediments and even threats to their ambitions. So what unfolded then is what scholars often call settler colonialism. Defined simply, settler colonialism is when invading colonizers removed and replaced indigenous populations. And at the root of settler colonialism is the elimination of native peoples, polities, and cultures, and the theft of indigenous homelands. The United States, much less Puget Sound, was not the only place where settler colonialism happened. It also marks Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Siberia, northern Japan, Israel, and parts of South Africa and China, among others. And settler colonialism is not over. It's still happening today. So in 1846, the United States and Great Britain negotiated the boundary between their respective imperial holdings in the Pacific Northwest. This is part of what was once called Oregon country. And they drew the line along the 49th parallel before zagging southwest to the eastern outlet of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, cutting across Coast Salish homelands and waters. With the boundary then finalized, the United States began encouraging white settlers to move to the region, specifically through the Donation Land Act of 1850. So depending on certain conditions, white male settlers could claim up to 320 acre, acres, double that if they were married. Most claims focused on lands that Coast Salish peoples had already cleared. I mean, who really wants to go to the, all the bother of cutting down a forest to begin planting your crops? Take, for example, Whidbey Island. South Whidbey Island, the homelands of many Snohomish families, consisted of thousands of acres of prairie. Settlers thought this land would be better utilized for fields and pastures, not what they called Indian hunting grounds. They ignored the reality that these were propertied camas fields owned by Native women whose families had managed them for generations. This is just one of many examples common throughout US history where the property of indigenous women was rendered invisible for the benefit of white settlers. Settlers also filed claims to Coast Salish village sites, such as a Snohomish Skagit village at what is today Oak Harbor. Captain Edward Barrington from Nova Scotia, in fact, I think there's even a statue of him around there somewhere, purchased two of the original claims, which included the village. He organized a group of settlers to drive the Indians down to the beach, making them carry away their houses, as witnessed by one Snohomish boy, recalling the scene as an elder later in 1920. Settlers also filed claims to forested lands, what an experienced Snohomish lumberman recalled as the nicest timber I think ever growed any place. While well, they promptly cleared, which they promptly cleared, devastating the watershed for salmon, further impacting Coast Salish customary livelihoods. By the time the act expired in 1855, 529 people had filed claims in Western Washington. And those claims ranged, ranged in size from 60 to 640 acres. In fact, over 290,000 acres have been claimed in what became Washington Territory. To put that in perspective, that's like twice the size of Whidbey Island. This is just in the first few years. We haven't even gotten to the treaties yet. These acts of violent dispossession resulted in a variety of responses from Coast Salish peoples. Some replied with theft and violence, such as an incident in the early 1850s when several Snohomish men hired to take a settler from southern Puget Sound to Port Townsend killed their passenger and stole his goods. Others relied on their kin networks to move to neighboring villages. For example, this is what brought increasing numbers of Snohomish families to Chemicum Valley on the Olympic Peninsula in the early 1850s. 
they had been pushed out of their homelands farther east, those initial uh, kind of donation land act claims. And as more refugees poured into the Chemicum Valley, tensions increased, which resulted in the Snohomish expelling the Chemicum Indians with the assistance of Sklallams and Suquamish allies in 1857. And just as they had done a generation earlier with Hudson's Bay Company employees, numerous Coast Salish women married settlers. The no Donation Land Act had incentivized white male settlers to take native wives because they could then double their land holdings. Yet indigenous women could not file their own claims. But Coast Salish women also had reasons to marry white settlers, especially those filing claims or purchasing homesteads carved out of a woman's ancestral homelands. This was one strategy used by Coast Salish people to extend kinship practices to the newcomers, to create new constellations of kin, using settler policies to maintain indigenous connections to ancestral lands. So this was the situation that I see five generations back within my own genealogy. Native women married white settlers. Their children then married other indigenous people of similar ancestry. And it was not unusual for these native women to raise their children, often alone when white husbands either left them, died, or went elsewhere for work. This was the situation for my own grandfather, raised primarily by his Snohomish mother and grandmother, and it's these women who taught him how to catch and preserve fish. So this was the historical context. Then for the negotiations over the Treaty of Point Elliot of 1855, signed just north at Muckleteo between territorial governor Isaac Stevens and Coast Salish leaders representing thousands of people. The Treaty of Point Elliot encompassed the lands north of the red line shown there on the map. Several generations of interactions with whites had brought some benefits, but even more substantially, demographic catastrophe to many communities through diseases. And moreover, early settler pressure on Coast Salish homelands had fueled rising tensions and violence. The federal government had instructed Stevens to negotiate land sessions with the territory's tribal nations so as to make room for the increasing numbers of settlers heading west. This map shows those Stevens treaties there in western Washington. Now, Governor Stevens was an ambitious man who inspired to national political office he was an ardent expansionist who tied national policy and liberty for white men to a realization of the nation's manifest destiny. Equally troubling was that he perceived Indians as inferior to whites. And just six years after negotiating this treaty and several others in Washington territory, the U.S. Civil War broke out. Stevens was commissioned into the army dying on the battlefield in 1862. Now, as most people know, uh, what the Stevens Treaties accomplished was that they transferred millions of acres of land to the federal government, which in turn dispersed and sold these lands to settlers, turned a profit. But what is generally less well known were the range of concessions that Coast Salish leaders made the government agree to. So oftentimes, people ask, why would Native peoples sign these treaties? They assume that the federal government co uh, coerced indigenous victims into giving away everything. And indeed, the federal government often used underhanded tactics to coerce Native peoples and nations into signing treaties. Government officials like Stevens threaten violence appointed leaders who did not have the authority to sign over land, even forging signatures. But just focusing on these shenanigans relegates Native negotiators to the limited role of victims. Instead, we need to examine these negotiations within the historical context of the time. 
then we can see how Coast Salish negotiators, like the seven Snohomish chiefs, among many others who signed the Treaty of Point Elliot, ensured that the treaties protected the interests of their peoples too. So in 1855, the Treaty of Point Elliot didn't seem like such a bad deal, especially to Snohomish leaders and other chiefs. Government officials created an initial set of reservations. These small reservations, circled in blue, were located around key villages. Port Madison, the Squamish Reservation. Quilceta Creek, the Tulalip Reservation. The Southeast Peninsula of Fidalgo Island, where the Sw Swinomish Reservation is. And the island in the Lummi River, the beginnings of the Lummi Reservation, along with a separate chunk of land at Tulalip for a school to educate Native children. And these promises were all codified in Article II of the treaty. The Muckleshoot Reservation was established later through two executive orders. So government negotiators, though, also told the thousands of assembled Coast Salish families that in a year, they would receive a big reservation, stretching south to north from what is today Edmonds to the Stillaguamish River around Stanwood and east to the Cascade Mountains. This is what you see that I've kind of lamely tried to approximate on a map in PowerPoint. So on this large reservation, Indians and their children and grandchildren would each get 80 acres of their own land. That's what was promised. Government officials hoped that they would later relocate all Western Washington Indians onto this large reservation Lots of ink back and forth between local officials and the federal government, you know, about the eagerness to concentrate us all into one place where they could carefully keep an eye on us. But Coast Salish leaders at the newly created small reservations understood something very different, that they could remain in their villages and that they would not need to move, and that this large reservation would then be enough space for everyone else to have land too. Government officials also promised that no whites would be allowed to settle these lands, thereby solving the problem of American squatters pushing Native families off their homelands and out of their villages. And more importantly, Native leaders in all the Stevens Treaties, including the Treaty of Point Elliot, reserved for themselves and their descendants in perpetuity continued hunting, fishing, and gathering rights at all usual and accustomed places, which included sites off reservation. As I have argued elsewhere, Washington's tribal nations would have never agreed to the treaty terms if these important rights were not recognized by the United States government. The treaties didn't create these rights. Our peoples always had them in perpetuity. We just codified them in the treaty. So reserving these rights meant that Coast Salish peoples could continue living as they had for generations while maintaining relations with their homelands, waters, and other than human kin. So in return for the lands that they sold, the government then promised to pay them $150,000, which in today's money is about five million bucks, and to provide a physician, medicines, carpenter, farmer, agricultural tools, and a blacksmith to support Coast Salish families. The cash and skills would allow our peoples to engage with the emerging settler economy on our own terms. So, at face value, the Treaty of Point Elliot wasn't such a bad deal, at least as understood by the thousands of Coast Salish peoples assembled there at Muckleteo in 1855. All those present at the treaty negotiations were official witnesses, as understood by Coast Salish legal practices. So it should come as no surprise that these witnesses remembered what government officials had said and taught their descendants about all the specific promises that had been made. 
Spoiler alert. <laughs> Problems with the federal government's treaty promises emerged quickly. First problem. The Senate took more than four years to ratify the treaty. This meant that the first several annuity payments did not arrive. And remember, this money wasn't welfare from a benevolent government. This was payment for lands Coast Salish peoples had sold. In fact, none of the signatories of the Treaty of Point Elliot saw those annuities until 1861. And they certainly didn't receive them as cash. Instead, they received cut-rate trade goods, such as poor quality blankets that the government agents were embarrassed to hand out. As the Senate dithered, sound familiar, increasing numbers of white settlers flooded onto Coast Salish lands. Many Coast Salish communities then turned to violence in what pioneers and subsequent historians have called the Territory's Indian War of 1855 and 1856. White settlers became afraid when Yakimas in eastern Washington killed a government agent that fall. They feared that all the territory's tribal nations would rise up to exterminate whites. Wonder what they were anxious about. So the territorial government called up the militia. And when the ranks were too thin, government agents hired northern Indians to fill out those ranks. Indigenous peoples from British Columbia and Alaska to fight their ancestral enemies in Puget Sound. So with this development, along with the delayed ratification of the treaties and continued white squatter violence against native peoples, this led some indigenous leaders to support an uprising that would force the government to negotiate a better deal and to immediately expel whites from their lands. But some indigenous peoples, such as many Snohomish warriors, fought to protect white settlers, believing that this would demonstrate to the government that they deserve to have the treaty promises fulfilled. We must always remember that there are hard decisions that our peoples were trying to make as they navigated these changing tides, figuring out what would best secure their sovereignty, their families, Overall, the conflict really wasn't much of an Indian war. As we can see from this very brief description, this wasn't the racial conflict envisioned by settlers. It was more like customary indigenous Pacific Northwest conflicts where threats and a handful of symbolic deaths were part of a broader negotiation strategy. And then there was a second problem that emerged from the treaty. The big reservation was never established. Somehow this large reservation from Stanwood to Edmonds and east to the Cascades never appeared in the final treaty document. Even the federal Indian agents on the ground in Washington territory seemed confused about what to tell Coast Salish peoples, or they just flat out lied when asked about the big reservation. The Indian agent at Tulalip told Snohomish families to come into the reservation so they could get their allotments. So many did. And as they waited, the agent had them work hard at clearly clearing the new reservation in preparation for farming. But after waiting for six months for their allotments, families drifted back to their ancestral villages only to find that white settlers had claimed these lands. Other agents told Coast Salish families living on Whidbey Island that a reservation would get created there. But one never was. And as government officials began to better understand the scale and complexity of Coast Salish societies in Western Washington, they realized that there were many other communities that had been left out of the Stevens Treaties. For example, my San Juan Island ancestors had been completely left out of the Treaty of Point Elliot negotiations. As Snohomish people and many other Coast Salish communities waited for the big reservation or for other new ones to get surveyed in the 1860s, many were reluctant to relocate to the small reservation at Tulalip and some of the other sites. 
They feared that ancestral enemies, the northern Indians from British Columbia and southeast Alaska, who the government had recently hired to fight against our peoples, could too easily raid the coastal site. Moreover, many of the families who had relocated to Tulalip were struggling in near starvation conditions in those early years. As late as 1875, only 80 acres of marshland had been tilled, which was not enough to support the families there. So those already off reservation stayed away, gravitating to villages where they had extended kin, such as those at Chemicum Valley and on San Juan Island, in the case of my ancestors, where they could still survive. But life in these places also became challenging as Congress passed the 1862 Homestead Act in the height of the Civil War. And like the earlier Donation Land Act, the Homestead Act also in incentivized white settler theft of Native homelands. Native women, like the Mitchell Bay and Snohomish ancestors on both sides of my grandfather's family, married white settlers as a way to remain on their lands as life on the reservation seemed too precarious. Male settlers eagerly sought Native wives in the territory because these women helped them survive and even thrive. By 1883, when the allotment process at Tulalip began, four years before Congress passed the Dawes Allotment Act to do this nationally, there was not enough land for everyone eligible for an allotment. Coast Salish families living off reservation lost out. Several of the documents in my grandfather's archive note Relatives on both sides of his family were denied allotments at Tulalip, where government officials had told them to apply because, as you can see, no land available. According to the superintendent in charge at Tulalip in 1914, a few years after allotment had finished, there are Indians who have no lands and for whom there is no land available. There never was enough land reserved to carry out the treaty pledges. By the early 20th century then, Western Washington had what the federal government officially called a landless Indian problem. These were the Coast Salish families, like mine, who had no allotments on the reservations. They found themselves on the margins of both settler and native societies. And these landless Indians once again turned to Coast Salish networks to meet this challenge. And this time they organized politically at multiple levels. In 1914, the landless, landless Samish, Duwamish, and Snohomish formed the Northwest Federation of American Indians. They thought that there would be strength in numbers. The NFAI learned that allotments would be available on the Quinault Reservation. They urged families to apply for allotments there. And in my grandfather's archive are several of these applications, as my relatives hoped to craft new relations to people and lands on the coast. And initially, the Quinault Tribal Council was supportive of hundreds of these allottees. But the Office of Indian Affairs rejected these petitions, deciding that only Native peoples on the Olympic Peninsula, on the Olympic Peninsula's west coast, south of the Macaw Reservation, would be eligible. So then at the NFAI's urging, the federal government appointed a special agent, Charles Roblin, to help enroll landless Western Washington Indians, another attempt to resolve this landless Indian problem. And he began compiling a list stopping after he had identified over 4,000 names. He literally just kind of threw up his hands in the air and said, I'm done. And many of those names had never appeared on reservation rolls before. My ancestors appear on Roblin's list. And it is through one of these names, Martin Rethlifson, that I am enrolled in the Snohomish tribe of Indians. In 1921, the NFAI petitioned Congress to allow for a court of claims case to sue the federal government for failed treaty promises under the Stevens Treaties. 
specifically the government's failure to provide for Washington's landless Indians. This resulted in the collection of thousands of depositions from Coast Salish individuals, some of whom had directly witnessed the negotiations for the Treaty of Point Elliot as children. Remember all those witnesses tasked with remembering? They didn't go away. While the Court of Claims recognized the marked and irrefutable failure of the federal government to honor the treaty promises, especially the failure to create the big reservation, they decided against any remuneration, arguing that the claimants, the landless Indians, had neglected to properly substantiate the monetary loss due to those treaty violations. As one scholar wrote, it was an instruction in federal Indian law. As the NFAI was building its advocacy for landless Indians, Snohomish families organized officially as the Snohomish Tribe of Indians in 1917. This was a deliberate political move to make our tribe legible to the federal government just as the United States entered World War I. And they began enrolling members. By 1927, there were 973 Snohomish on the rolls, many of whom had never received an allotment. And many continued enrolling throughout the 20th century. By the turn of the century, enrollment had grown to 1,720 members. So politicizing our constellations of kin in the 1910s set the stage for continued and ongoing efforts to get our status and treaty rights recognized by the federal government. There are many important developments to detail in the last century, but this is a subject for another time. So as I conclude my talk this evening, I want you to consider how this history of one Snohomish family, mine, illustrates the efforts of Coast Salish peoples, particularly Native women, at maintaining and adapting our constellations of kin to meet the historical and continued challenges of settler colonialism. As outsiders stole our lands and contested our very belonging in Western Washington, these matriarchs pursued customary ways to live on the edge of empire in places like San Juan Island, Chemicum Valley, and the foothills of the Cascades. And their histories reveal strategies of adaptation and persistence that mark the Snohomish nation illuminating the creative ways that Coast Salish peoples sought to make the best of an increasingly difficult situation. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, to begin, just if we can just give Dr. Reed a hand again and, and Chairman Evans for this wonderful talk. That was an incredibly rich lecture and I really, really appreciate it. There are things, uh, after uh, having lived here for 10 years, 10 years, I think I've learned a lot and I've talked to you a lot uh, in our time together, Josh. Um, but that was really, that was really, really um, wonderful to hear. Um, you know, I think your talk for me really begs the question of how these patterns continue today and how these strategies, both in terms of um, strategies from a settler colonial perspective, but also strategies from Coast Salish perspective in responding in creative, adaptive ways mm -hmm. continue to this day. So I'm wondering, uh, as I'm sure some audience members are, if you could take us maybe to say a little bit forward to the present, to how these patterns continue. I need to make sure I keep my distance or our mics uh, too okay. <clears throat> um, Yeah, you know, there, there are a variety of different ways. Um, you know, all Native nations adapt and change over time as they begin to explore various ways that they can continue to exercise their self-determination. Uh, and to really kind of, as I, you know, with that note that I ended on at the end, to make the best of an increasingly difficult situation. 
Um, you know, and so this, for, you know, for us, uh, the Snohomish tribe of Indians, you know, part of that is, you know, trying to gain that recognition, to gain that, you know, kind of legibility in the eyes of the government. Even though we sign the treaties, we can track our histories, you know, pretty clearly, um, you know, one of those challenges is meeting is, or one of the uh, strategies is how we're going to meet that. Um, I'm not really the expert on federal recognition, so there isn't too much more that I can say about that. But beyond that, we're also pursuing ways that we can continue just acting as a tribal nation, being ourselves. Uh, you know, Mike referenced to having my mom and sister and my niece in a class. The class he's talking about is a Lushootse class uh, that they've been taking online, uh, where he's teaching them how to speak the language. Um, you know, and so those are ways that we continue to, you know, kind of, you know, practice uh, our, you know, culture today. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from the audience member. Has delving deep into your family history made you think differently about your previous work on Macaw histories? <laughs> um, yes and no. Um, you know, a lot of the history work that I did, um, you know, the research that I did with Macaws up at Nia Bay involved a lot of family history, um, you know, and that was part of what they wanted me to pursue. And so part of what I'm finding is a resonance between these, this, this type of historical research where, you know, our histories are maintained through family lines, through our lineages. And so doing that family history out at Nia Bay, and it's work that I continue to do when asked by the MCRC, the Macaw Culture and Research Center, um, it's very similar to the approaches that I take as I start to delve into my own family history. Um, and one of the other things, too, that also struck me is, you know, as I was preparing for this, uh, you know, for this talk this evening, I was like, wow, I, you know, I don't know as much about Coast Salish history as I do about Northwest Coast uh, history, like the historiography, the other scholarship that's written. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, frantically trying to, you know, motor through the last 20 years of Coast Salish uh, scholarship. And, you know, I'm going through this stuff last week and I'm like, wait a second, certain names are beginning to resonate. And I'm flipping through this. I'm like, oh my God, that's my family that is written here in these pages. You know, and that makes me kind of reflect on, you know, some of the surprise or that kind of, oh, wow, or huh moment that, you know, I imagine that a number of Macaw readers have also felt going through my book. Um, you know, and so, you know, it's, I hope that I've done all those different histories justice, and it's only by doing that kind of work in an accountable way with tribal nations and with indigenous families that you can begin to do this work. Another audience member question. Is it true um, the Roblin rolls, is it? Yep. Um, did not count Indian women who married whites? Uh, no, that's not true. Um, I mean, my family members show up on the Roblin rolls, and as I discussed today, there were a number of those ancestors who had married non-natives. There, I'm sure that, you know, again, he stopped when he hit about 4,000. He was just like, you know, I can keep going, guys, but it's just going to keep getting longer. And until there's a solution, I don't know what more to do. And so I imagine that a number of people uh, were not counted on the Roblin rolls. Uh, I wanted to segue to this moment we're in, in terms of Coast Salish revitalization. Yeah. I mean, having been here for 10 years, I just see so many active things that are happening in terms of language revitalization, um, community you know, growth, um, the growth of tribal nations in the region, tribal canoe journeys. It just seems that there's a ton of energy at this moment. Um, can you speak to that as a response and, you know, and, and just sure. the way of thinking about this his larger history that you've been presenting? Yeah, I, you know, hardly a week goes by when I'm not pinching myself for being probably one of the luckiest people in the academy for being able to be home to do the type of work that I do, to work here at the University of Washington where I can continue working in community, in my homelands, and with students from my homelands. 
And you know, that is incredibly re rewarding to see and work with those students here at both the undergraduate and graduate level in some cases. Um, and then to see that you know, we teach Lachute Seed finally once again on campus uh, through the efforts that you, know, you and others and AIS have really pushed forward and all the great work that Tammy Hone does uh, with bringing that language to our students. And then of course, the UW Canoe family. I mean, that's just a huge deal to have that happen here at the UW and to have our canoe family successfully, you know, engage in canoe journeys uh, and, and all the great, you know, kind of kinship networks that are now being created as, you know, the students are engaging with that, all the great help that, you know, Mike has provided our UW canoe family. It's like, you know, this is like literally what I'm talking about. I, I focused on it historically, but I see those types of same connections continuing today. So it's a very exciting time to be at home doing this kind of work. Are there, we have time for one more question and I have, a, I have the cards here, but I was wondering if we could get a question from the audience if there's any questions that we haven't addressed. Yep. So he's reflecting on the Bolt decision, uh, asking about that, uh, which we're you know, marking the 50th year anniversary of that landmark decision. And his question is, why isn't there a terrestrial version of that? Why hasn't there been you know, like a push for the big reservation? That's what the Court of Claims piece was for um, back in the 1820s, I'm sorry, 1920s. I think they finally decided it in 1935, which in federal government time is actually really quick. The Indian Claims Commission took a lot longer. Federal recognition cases take a lot longer. Um, and so in, in some ways, I think that was probably the closest equivalent to that push to get that terrestrial piece uh, recognized. But think about what that would be. You know, the Bolt decision, in common with, made, a, you know, made an adjudication that uh, is what we all learned in kin kindergarten. In common with means you share. Sharesies means 50%. So what's gonna happen with the land piece? Clearly it's not 50%. It wasn't a discussion about in common with relative to the land. That's very particular to fishing rights in that, in that uh, clause in the treaty, but Part of the problem from the federal government's perspective is that the big reservation never appeared in the treaty, even though it was discussed, even though it shows up in deposition after deposition for that court of claims case in the 1920s and 1930s, the federal government doesn't recognize that. And that's a very common thing. And so if there was going to be a court case like that, and our Supreme Court would certainly give a thumbs up to native rights and restoration of homelands. I have no doubt that that is exactly what would happen. Um, yeah, I live in an alternate universe. Um, but uh, you know what that would practically mean is something that would shake the very foundation of settler colonialism itself. And I don't necessarily see that happening anytime soon. And so we had that moment, whether that would have meant land restoration or at least big payouts, I'm not sure, but um, it didn't happen. I'd like to close with, uh, with a question that, um, that's another on a personal level. Josh, I know that you teach at Friday Harbor Labs at some times, you've teach, taught a class up there at times, yep. and that, um, as, as you all know, that's, that's right near where your family members' yeah. land is. So I'm, I just want to ask on a personal level, when you're there, teaching up there and living on San Juan Island, when you're teaching that course and you're, you're, you're moving through these very lands that your ancestor, Carolyn Daly, lived on with her family, yeah. what, how, what is that experience for you? And what, what goes through your mind as you reflect on that history of, of your ancestor being there? You know, it's, <clears throat> it's just more confirmation that I'm incredibly lucky to be able to teach in my homelands. That is literally in my homelands um, for, you know, one side of uh, my indigenous family, one side of my Coast Salish family. Um, so, you know, it's always been 
you know, I wonder how much of this is just nostalgic hindsight where I'm like, oh, no wonder I've always thought that San Juan Islands are amazing and I should just spend as much time up there as I, as I can possibly do so. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it does really resonate with me. Um, you know, so it feels good to be up there working with students and, um, you know, to literally be doing what I do in my homelands. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I want to thank you all for, for coming. Let's give another hand. Thank you.